There are some people that say size isn't everything, and there are others that say, if you're gonna have one, have a big one. Well, how about this for a big one? Honda's giant trail bike, the Varadero. The Varadero is powered by a 1,000cc V-twin motor lifted straight from Honda's VTR Firestorm, so you can rightly expect it to be pretty exciting. There are, however, some engineering modifications. The Varadero uses a larger flywheel, which helps to smooth out some of the lumpiness which all V-twins suffer from at low revs. It also slows the acceleration slightly. You wouldn't want to be sat this high up in the air on something which accelerates with the same force as a Honda Firestorm. Another significant change is the use of 42mm carburettors in place of the 48mm used on the VTR. But don't be fooled into thinking that the power of this motor has been completely killed off. It definitely hasn't, still a very, very capable machine. It'll still produce 94 brake horsepower, which is about a dozen or so less than a Firestorm, but it's still better than anything else in this giant trailer class. Another modification on the engine is down at the bottom. So the sump, the sump is smaller on the Varadero, got less capacity, and that's to provide more ground clearance because this thing is supposed to look like an off-road bike. Well, it does look like an off-road bike. The fact that it's completely hopeless off-road is besides the point. The problem is it's simply too big and it's far too heavy to cope with any serious terrain, any serious rough terrain. A few potholes and cobble streets, not a problem. But if the going gets tough, don't bother trying it on one of these. There's no point having an off-road bike that you can't even pick up. So it must be good at something. Well, yes, it's excellent at sustained long distance travel, hour after hour, if you like. And really, apart from your dedicated tourers like your Pan Europeans and your Gold Wings, there's very little to touch it in the comfort stakes. The seat is superb, as good as any touring machine. You're not going to get a sore bottom sat on that for many, many hours. And the whole riding position, really, it is, well, it's first class. The foot pegs aren't too high, they're not too far back, you're not going to get sore, aching knees. Position of the bars is just about spot on. Absolutely no strain on your arms or your wrists. You can sit there all day long. It's really good. Windscreen's fairly efficient, not bad. It tends to just catch the top of my helmet a little bit. So I have to just squat down slightly. But if I squat down slightly, straight over my head. Don't get a headache. No wind noise in my helmet. Really is excellent. Big bulbous fairing, which does a reasonable sort of a job at throwing most of the wind and rain away from your body and the upper part of your legs. And also, very important, when you sat this high up, visibility is excellent. So when you're touring over across the continent through all your, your nice countries and your sightseeing holidays, you can see over all the hedges on the country lanes and you can see everything, it's superb. Also superb in a busy city traffic because you're in a jam, you can see across the top of the cars, through the traffic lights, across the junctions, it really is very, very useful. So far, so good, but there is one thing that really, really does bug me and that's this thing down here a side stand and that's it a side stand we haven't got a main stand and I've said it before and I'll say it again on a bike that's capable of going for hundreds and thousands of miles and well capable of carrying some luggage you need a main stand you need to get it straight upright it's as simple as that talking about luggage no panniers are standard on this I suppose you could fit some panniers on there maybe well you could certainly fit a top box on there but you do get this rack as standard. Nice big chunky grab rails there for your pillion to hang on to. Not going to get aching fingers. Nothing to dig into the back of your fingers there. Very, very comfy. You could strap a few bits and pieces on there. Under the seat, there's a tiny, and I mean tiny amount of storage space. I won't even bother showing it to you. You get very little under there. Might just squeeze a disc lock in if you're lucky, but not much else. And I'll tell you something else that bugs me. Really having a good moan today, aren't we? But just look at this. No, I mean, I'm sorry, but I don't see the point of this. Petrol cap there. Key in there, quite normal, nothing unusual there. Then watch this. Look at that, it comes off. Why does it come off? Why does it not flip back or hinge or something? I don't know. There's no reason for it to come off. It's just a nuisance. And not just that, but when you put it back on, you've got to push it down and then, you know, it's, it's when you've got gloves on and that at a petrol station and you're freezing cold in the middle of winter, it's just, not necessary, you just don't need problems like that. But long distance travel is where the Varadero really does excel. 
when the sports bike riders are stopping every couple of hours to realign their elbow and knee joints and maybe get some semblance of feeling back into their wrists, the Varadero rider can plod relentlessly on and on, hour after hour, country after country if you like. It's that comfortable, it's that effortless to ride. Fuel stops too don't have to be too frequent. A tank capacity of 25 litres will take you somewhere close to 180 miles before the warning lamp starts to flash. The Varadero really is an excellent long distance tourer, so how does it compare with the others in this class? On price, it beats the lot. At £7,300, it's cheaper than Triumph's Tiger by a couple of hundred pounds. And it beats BMW's 1100GS and their new 1150GS by well over £1,000. I make that 1-0 to the Honda. Now the motor on this Varadero is, as we've said, it's more or less the same as a VTR Firestorm, so really need I say any more, you know how good that is. Unless of course you don't like V-twins, not everybody likes a V-twin. You might prefer a Triumph Tiger, it's a 900cc triple cylinder motor, even if it is, I think, a little bit mechanical and noisy, it's a Triumph, you might like that. You might prefer BMW's flat boxer twin in their GS, even if it does have a rather strange wobble when you're sat at the traffic lights. And if you've never noticed that, get on one, sit at the lights and just blip the throttle, just a tiny bit and you'll feel the bike go like that. It just rocks to the side. Not like that, like that. Nothing wrong with it, it's just a bit weird and a bit strange the first time you experience it. Now, giant trailies aren't the prettiest of bikes, I'll agree. They're not meant to be, they're built to do a purpose. They're very, very functional. No streamlined, sleek fairings and no racy paint jobs. If that's what you want, then you buy a sports bike. But they're all much of a muchness, really, the giant trailies. None of them are really much better equipped than the others. They're all pretty similar. The dashboard on this one isn't any better, isn't really any worse than anything else. We've no fuel gauge on this. We've got a fuel warning lamp down there, but we have got a, a nice little clock in the middle, which I think is great, always very useful, especially if you're going touring for hour after hour. This one has got dual CBS, Honda's combined braking system, which is very, very good. BMW's has got ABS, Triumph's Tiger, well, that's just got reasonably good brakes. So really, you pays your money and you takes your choice. I don't think anyone is significantly better than the other. But if you want a bike that can take you to work and back every day of the week, commute through the busy city traffic with no problem at all, give you great comfort, use it at the weekends, good performance, and could even take you on holiday, then you could do a lot worse than buying one of these. And I think I know which one I'll be taking on my holidays.